Good day, Bob, and first of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Uh, as a note to our viewers, a couple of months ago, I saw someone on social media who made the remark, How come I'm just now finding out about information mapping? What's up with that? Why haven't I seen this before? So that was my prompt to reach out to you as the creator of information mapping to see if you'd be interested in letting me interview you so that I might add you to my collection of HPT Human Performance Technology Legacy videos and help others learn more about information mapping and your other contributions. Um, and so uh, let me begin here. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you do and perhaps some of the more interesting things you've worked on um, in your career? Well, my name is Bob Horn, um, Robert E. Horn, for people who are searching on the Internet. Uh, I've been at Stanford uh, University as a research scholar for the last uh, 25 years or so. And uh, the main things that I do there uh, is work with international task forces on different um, uh, major world problems. And uh, before that, um, I got uh, involved in uh, uh, a long time ago in uh, performance technology. When uh, even before it was called performance technology, it was called programmed instruction. Mm -hmm. In uh, 1961, um, I was 28 years old at the time, um, and I. <laughs> ran into uh, the work of uh, programmed instruction at a cocktail party where a linguist who was working at the Center for Programmed Instruction in New York City uh, you know, introduced, uh, told me about uh, their work and uh, I was doing freelance editing at the time. I had, I had just returned from France uh, where I had attempted to write a novel and failed, and so I was doing freelance editing, and I said, well, maybe you need a freelance editor there. And she says, well, you know, I'll introduce you. And and so I went up, interviewed, and they hired me uh, part-time, and in a few months I was managing a third of the uh, organization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Partially because I had previously worked uh, in the computer industry for a year uh, as a software person and then as, a, as an analyst and, and, and uh, proposal writer. So I had some, you know, had some experience that was pretty rare uh, in those days. Um, uh, we, we actually, I worked at Univac where we thought uh, when I started, we would sell at least five computers that year. Hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, how did, how did that uh, then segue into you uh, inventing, creating information mapping? Well, um, I just uh, give a, a couple of hi a little history. I, I stayed at, at, at um, uh, what was called CPI, Center for Programming Instructions, at, stayed at CPI for uh, about a year, and then a, 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 a new consulting company based on programmed instruction called Basic Systems uh, hired me, and I managed about a third of that company. Uh, and then I, but I didn't really like uh, that so well. Uh, it, the, the pace was was a little little um, too fast for me, so I I quit and went back to CPI and became this the director of training and consulting there. Hmm. And that's where, uh, that's where I ran into uh, Gary Rummler, um, who hired me uh, the next year in 1963 uh, to, uh, to become a jet set professor and fly out to Michigan and help teach uh, the courses he was giving there in, in, Ann, in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. uh, well, CPI uh, which was a nonprofit organization funded b very liberally by uh, the Ford Foundation and Carnegie Foundation, 
Um, we had a, a staff of about, well, at that time, about 10 or 12 people. And Columbia University uh, started to pay attention to uh, this field and called it educational technology. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, they uh, asked our, organ our, our, our nonprofit organization to become part of Teachers College and become the new, uh, the first uh, institute for educational technology. And so I was given a, um, uh, an appointment there for two years as a research associate and a chance to do whatever I uh, wanted to do, teach a course or so and take courses and, and do whatever research I wanted to. And that's where I uh, invented information mapping. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then that, that took you, you told me earlier when we were talking about doing this interview, that mm -hmm. that kind of a logical extension of that became visual language for you. Can you tell us a little bit about visual language? Oh, that was much later. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, the, um, inv the invention of information mapping then went on to uh, uh, to, to become a, a company called Information Mapping Incorporated, mm -hmm. uh, which I uh, suddenly became an entrepreneur <laughs> and, and, a, uh, and a CEO. Uh, it was initially a research company, and the, uh, the U.S. Air Force sponsored uh, us for four years, rather, w to do research on information mapping. And then we became much more of a consulting and training company. Um, and I, I stayed there for 20 years uh, and uh, had a heart attack at, at, at 50 years old and decided that, that, that running a company wasn't a very good idea for me. I see. <laughs> so, so, so I found somebody else to, uh, to become the president and then eventually sold uh, the company to him. Doug Gorman uh, is his name. Mm -hmm. And so then how did that all then lead to you working on what you had described as social messes? Uh, or... Well, I, I'm still trying to answer visual language Oh, here. okay, sorry. So then, then I went off to, uh, then I decided, well, uh, I didn't want to shovel snow anymore because I was, uh, I had founded and ran the company uh, at, uh, 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 Boston, in the Boston area, in Lexington, Massachusetts, basically. And uh, so I, I decided I would move to uh, 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 Seattle and also the Bay Area. Seattle because my daughter lived there, and and the Bay Area because I thought it was just a fine place to live. Um, and uh, while I had been at uh, uh, information mapping and working with information mapping, uh, I had, you know, the, the Macintosh computer, of course, arrived, mm -hmm. and uh, I got one, and I said, this changes everything for us, because doing visual material in uh, early work was, was, was very expensive and very difficult, and mm -hmm. suddenly the Macintosh made it easy. Uh, and at that time, also, I began to realize that there was something like a new language uh, uh, emerging, which was, uh, as I defined it, the, the, the tight integration of words, images, and shapes. Mm -hmm. So they're all working together, each doing what it does best. So you don't try to you don't try to describe a horse. You just draw it. You just show it, mm -hmm. and that's become very common these days. But in when I was thinking about it, twenty some you know, more than twenty years ago. Uh, it was it was a novel idea, and nobody had actually studied the grammar and syntax and semantics of how you put words and images together. Hmm. So that's what I spent about ten years at Stanford doing, and 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 uh, came out with a book called Visual Language. Uh, let's see. I'll wave it in front of you. Yes, it's still available. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, I ordered. I ordered uh, it the other day, and and it hasn't arrived yet. But uh, yeah, good. Very interesting. Uh, and and it's it it you know it it was 
uh, another amazing chance to uh, investigate an area of knowledge which nobody had really done very much work on. And there had been little patches of of, of things, um, and and of course there had been inventions of of putting words and visual elements together uh, for uh, roughly uh, three thousand years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There are stone tablets that show uh, marks in tabular form. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that are that are almost two thousand. You know, almost back in the in, uh, you know a thousand years before now, or no, two thousand years before now. Yeah. Anyway, um, so it was, a, but but nobody had really put the you know really put the in particular the syntax and semantics together of those two things, and so that's that's what. That's what you'll find in the book. Uh, and it turned out that after that, uh, I, well, originally I was trained as a, a, as a political scientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> long before programmed instruction, I had, uh, I had done uh, a, a variety of uh, things in the, in the government. Um, but I went, I decided that visual language was a way that one could ex express um, the, the, the kind of complexity and context that we need to understand very difficult big subject matters. I mean, the, the mural in back uh, of me, um, I call it an information mural, and I've been making them for about the last 20 years to address this kind of question of complexity uh, and uh, context. Mm -hmm. Can you describe this uh, information mural behind you to us a, a bit? Well, I'll try. Let me. Uh, I'll get up and walk over there. Mm -hmm. So this uh, this was a a, a a consulting engagement that I had with the British agency that's in charge of nuclear waste disposal. Uh -huh. And this mirror, this is a smaller version. Actually, uh, the, the, the delivery where it sits on the, in the wall of their cafeteria is about twice as big. It's about twice as high. Can you and, adjust your camera a bit so that uh, we're, we're cutting your head off here and we're not seeing the top of the graphic? Ah, uh, okay. Here. Yeah, that's good. That's good. How's that? Very good. All right. So, the managing director told us, uh, I have about 60 scientists running around the country drilling holes and doing, uh, doing chemistry and all kinds of things uh, with our high-level nuclear waste that comes from our nuclear power stations. Uh, and we have a Blue Ribbon Commission coming up, and, and I want you to do your thing and show us what you think we think, which is a wonderful assignment. Uh, I had a, a colleague uh, in England who also helped me with some of the interviews. I went over a couple of times to interview with them. And what we produced then, uh, basically, is uh, the history of the nuclear age up to about here with uh, simulated headlines of different events in the nuclear age. Then, in the center here, the decision, current decision-making environment of the agency itself. And then, over here, their planned future. 12,000-year plan they have for high-level nuclear waste. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. So, uh, and this, and the, and the mural is divided into uh, several sections. For example, the purple area here is 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 the is the agency area, the governance area, and we ha we have uh, uh, significant current events, social climate, science and technology, the waste and its dangers, and what I call the mythosphere, which are the fears and concerns of of um, people about radioactive waste. Mm -hmm. And of course the mural goes out 
uh, I put it out at 12,000 years when I showed the first draft to the managing director and his staff. And he said, oh, no, no, no. It's got to go out to a million years. <laughs> so we had a discussion about uh, how much hallway space he'd need for me to make a mural that went out a million years. And I decided to truncate it and just put it at the end. I uh, see. Very all interesting. Right. So this so is one. Is, is this what you would refer to as one of these social messes that uh, you address? Well, yes, I would call it a mega mess, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we, 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 some countries have decided to to uh, bury the waste. Um, the UK decided that it would put it in barrels and put it down in the earth, but be able to retrieve it. But they haven't started to do it yet. <laughs> Takes a while. Uh, mostly because of social issues and, and, and political issues sure. uh, that stand in the way of it. Well, you told me that uh, you've also, besides uh, n helping organizations or the world address nuclear waste, you talked about climate change. Can you tell us a little bit what you uh, were doing with that uh, mess? Yes. Yes, uh, again, that was uh, that started in England in about 2002 or three, um, when I was asked to uh, give a lecture uh, to the, the British Foreign Office, the, social, the, the policy staff of the, of the British Foreign Office. And at the end of my lecture, uh, a man came up and said, uh, well, I'm in charge of, of climate change. And he said, I have, it's very complicated. And I have to explain it to our 180 posts around the world. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Can you help me? <laughs> so, so we worked. Uh, we worked on that, and then, uh, based based on that project, we did another project on climate and energy for four departments of the of the of uh, the UK government, mm -hmm. because they were looking ahead. Uh, to to uh, uh, Tony Blair at the time had. Put it on the uh, on the agenda of the group of eight meeting that he was hosting in Scotland, and so we did another project like that, and I did another mural. I see, interesting. Well, and then as uh, uh, very much in the news today is North Korea, and you had mentioned that you had also worked in that arena. Yes, uh, very uh, more briefly, and it was it didn't. Uh, end up uh, anywhere because, uh, well, this is about four years ago, uh, Peter Hayes of the Nautilus Institute uh, asked me to be part of a team with, with him and, and Morton Halperin, who, were, who had plans for a uh, track two diplomacy. This is a private citizen diplomacy, and, and Hayes and, and Halperin had remained in contact with the North Koreans. Halperin was a, a longtime U.S. Um, uh, State Department and, and, and Defense Department official, uh, and Hayes is a, 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 a researcher in Australia at the Nautilus Institute. And and uh, they were we were de devising a, a denuclearization plan for uh, the whole Southeast a uh, Northeast Asia um, area. Japan, South Korea, North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we had a couple of good meetings where we where the relevant people that we got together, the uh, many of them uh, experts in universities and and former uh, generals who were in charge of the military and in South Korea and so forth. Uh, but then uh, North Korea started exploding nuclear weapons and uh, testing them, and uh, and our project had to stop. There was no there was no chance to proceed at the time. Well, now maybe now maybe we can again, but wow. but uh, but not in in the track two way. Well, let's hope that uh, turns out to be true, and something can come of that and uh, resolve yes. that issue. Let let me shift gears here a little bit. Um, 
Um, you kind of referred to this as your first exposure to human performance technology or performance improvement. It's known by many different names. Was uh, mm -hmm. uh, via programmed instruction, and and so can you? And I know that you had been a, a member, or you were very involved in the very first chapter of NSPI, the National Society for Programmed Instruction, before it became the National Society for Performance and Improvement, and then later on, as nowadays it's known as the International Society for Performance Improvement. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about uh, um, your involvement in NSPI way back in the day? Well, uh, back to back in the, well, uh, so I don't remember exactly how it happened, but uh, uh, somehow Gabe Ofeis contacted us uh, at CPI, and uh, and I think then that that Roger Kaufman and I started or you know set up the first meeting of a bunch of people, uh -huh. <laughs> which which kind of then became you know when you're starting an organization it's just a bunch of people yeah. you know less than twenty, <laughs> and we were you know we were in New York City so uh, that's where we did it. <laughs> <laughs> and Gabe, uh, Gabe is known as the founder of NSPI, and uh, I guess this would have been the start of it. The very first conference was in 1962, um, yeah. but there was activity before that very first conference. Um, yes, and I don't remember. He was a, he was a colonel in the in the Air Force uh, and in the training area in the Air Force. I don't remember whether by the time. And he started NSPI that he had left, he had retired from the Air Force, is it? You know, I, I'm I don't, sure. I know he was down in San Antonio, and that's where the very yeah. first conference was. But um, And there's a, there's a video of him online at the 25th mm -hmm. anniversary conference uh, reminiscing about uh, those early days. And uh, that's kind of interesting for those who are interested in going way back. He was a fun, he was a fun person, and, and some years later I taught uh, information. He went to Catholic University in um, in Washington, D.C. And uh, just after I invented information mapping and, just, and, and did the research on it, he had me come and teach a course on information mapping at Catholic University. Mm -hmm. So we stayed in touch over, over the years. Well, as a political science who made the shift into programmed instruction and uh, as a means for improving performance. Uh, can you talk a little bit about who your biggest influencers were back then, people or articles or books that you uh, remember from back then? Well, uh, obviously Skinner was, was uh, a, a huge influence. Uh, a Center for Programming Instruction had been set up basically to... Uh, uh, Develop what Skinner had said was possible, uh -huh. <laughs> and Skinner had, you know, suggested that there was something that 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 programmed instruction would be a a, a a bunch of sentences with words left out, basically, and he he gave us fifteen or seventeen something like that uh, sentences uh, of of some on some kind of instructional material, and that was it. That was the example we had, mm -hmm. and. Our job was to invent the whole field of programmed instruction from that, mm -hmm. <laughs> and from his and from his articles and books. So I, you know, I read his all his books and and um, but I had worked in the computer industry, so uh, cybernetics was also a major uh, influence on me. Uh, as uh, 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 it was in the air, uh, the, the the conferences, uh, the Macy conferences with. Margaret Mead and, and Gregory Bateson had been happening right after World War II. Herbert Simon was starting to do research. Um, uh, the people at Basic Systems that uh, I worked at I worked with, Don Bullock, Stu Margulies, uh, were were also um, st either uh, students of Skinner. Um, so all of those people, uh, and clearly uh, the people out at Michigan as well. Uh, Rumler and, and 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 others um, were all were all influential in my thinking, mm -hmm. and I I would say also um, uh, Bob Mager, uh -huh. 
was extremely important for me because he was he was uh, a little a little bit inside and a little bit outside of that. He had you know he was he was kind of the elder in the in the group. Oh, and I didn't mention uh, Sue Mar Sue Markle, who was who was uh, uh, the chief um, uh, Skinner uh, PhD graduate uh, who. Uh, was our expert at uh, at uh, Center for Programmed Instruction. Um, although she did not come to she did not come to uh, Columbia with us. I forget what she did, but she she went off something some other place. She went off she went off to the University of Illinois. She got a, a, a full professorship there. Uh -huh. Yeah, in Chicago. Okay, so my next question, shifting gears a little bit here, is that. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, um, I'm, part of this video series is to show the diversity of performance improvement or HPT or whatever anybody wants to call it. But So how do you <laughs> describe in that short uh, elevator speech, uh, how do you explain yourself to others? Well, I work on the world's biggest problems with information mapping, visual language, structured writing, uh, and a um, dozen other kinds of uh, techniques uh, that go into organizational development and what I call mess mapping. And the big problems in the world are nuclear weapons, sustainability, climate change, uh, and other kinds of messes at different levels of governance and society. Thank you. I didn't time it, but that's pretty short and sweet for <laughs> for uh, quite a load to carry, if if you will. Um, well, I work with others, you know. I don't, don't, you know, don't work alone on these kinds of things, sure. and, and and one has to get expertise from all sorts of fields, and to be able and, and I and I in, on my website uh, bobhorn.us, I describe myself as as a synthesizer, as well as a as well as an artist and and political scientist. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your current focus or your next focus for learning or some of the writing that you're doing? Uh, what are you working on that uh, now that or soon that, that you can share with us? Well, I have a, I have a book that um, uh, is at a publisher right now. Um, being considered, they haven't, they haven't decided to buy it yet, but it's called The Little Book of social messes, uh -huh. and it's about 150 pages long, and it it describes how hum we human beings get into our our mega messes and our social messes, and uh, and uh, a few approaches that maybe help us get through them or reduce the messiness of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the main thing I work on. <laughs> All right, uh, so it's. It's always with task forces, and often different levels. Sometimes, uh, you know, quite often in the in on on I worked on the county level with different kinds of mess, uh -huh. mental health delivery, uh, delivery of services to uh, 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 the elderly and disabled, and and so forth. Do you have a particular uh, focus for studying or learning that uh, it, it helps you with some of your assignments? Well, uh, systems, uh, systems analysis has always been a, a, a major uh, aspect of my work. I, I ran into it very early out of the uh, connection with uh, cybernetics. Uh -huh. It's sort of, uh, sort of an offshoot of cybernetics, also, but also of uh, the addressing of, uh, of complexity in, uh, in, actually in World War II grew out of that, those, those problems that of uh, management and organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, that and, and, and the, the general background in, in, in political science. And of course, running a company for, for, for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> you learn a lot that way too. <laughs> and our clients were, were very large, um, very large companies, you know, Fortune 100 companies. Mm -hmm. AT&T was our largest client, at least at the time I was uh, running the company. Mm -hmm. DuPont was another one. Um, this is a standard question in what <laughs> I uh, include in these interviews, but 
Is, is yeah. there a favorite uh, HP or performance improvement term or uh, some term or a phrase that you use in your work that you would like to define for us because you feel perhaps the current understanding of the term is problematic or it's, some, it's something that's being misused? Is there something that you can help those of us working in the domain uh, help clarify for us? Sure. Uh, I, I think um, I, I, I probably will we'll talk about uh, information mapping and structured writing. Okay. Um, because uh, basically I invented both of those terms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, re uh, I believe that, uh, well, information mapping refers to uh, the research that I did that, that I found that there were essentially 40 categories that you could uh, sort all the sentences of a subject matter into and the and structure and so when I went to uh, form a company um, I I went to a lawyer and uh, I said I want to call it uh, you know I call it we want to register it as a as a, as a trademark and uh, he said well what's the generic of it ah uh -huh. Uh, and I had to think, well, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I went home, thought a couple of days, and said, uh, the generic is structured writing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and that mean, and structured writing has to do with chunking information into relatively small bits, which, which is a part of information mapping, but other people do it. Um, and it's very useful if... Uh, you know, if there's one good rule, and that's put a headline on every and on every paragraph or every small chunk of information. Mm -hmm. That way, you can skip it if you don't if you already know it. Uh -huh. and we need to be able to do that in these days because we're in the situation of so much overload, information overload. So this facilitates uh, skimming or scanning and. Uh Letting yes. you uh, dive in. So what? So what is your definition then of information mapping? Oh, it's a method of uh, of analyzing or and organizing information into uh, and displaying it. And uh, you know, I built it into a uh, with other elements of human performance technology into a, a whole life cycle uh, uh, document. Uh, well, sorry, document life cycle uh -huh. uh, methodology. So it starts all the way from, you know, well, you just know, you're just assigned uh, some sort of topic and you've got to learn it and, and analyze it and get all the, all the, the chunks sorted into uh, 40 different kinds. And then we also found a, a, a subcategory called uh, uh, topics or maps. Um, you, could, you could assemble the 40 kinds into seven different kinds and uh, then then it was then it was possible to use various uh, sequencing algorithms for putting these in order for someone for training or for uh, reference work or job aids as, as, as it's sometimes called uh -huh. is that clear yes excellent and you do and you do have a book is the book generally available or do people have to buy it used nowadays uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I sold the company and the copyrights to everything. Uh, the, the, the one book that I wrote since uh, leaving information, right at the end of information mapping was, was one called uh, Mapping Hypertext. Yes. Uh, it's apparently pretty rare. Uh, okay. I had to buy that used the other day. Yeah. Um, but it has uh, it has several chapters on information mapping and is a good is, is I, I thought of as a good overview and I was uh, really trying well it was it was written um, before the World Wide Web actually uh, came out uh -huh. uh, it was published um, four year three or four years before that uh, because I, I I I had known Doug Engelbart who was the basically the, the the founder of, of hypertext, mm -hmm. uh, the first guy who did any kind of realization of it out here in California, 
and uh, and I realized that our two methodologies work together, and and uh, information mapping could be could be still, and it's still a could be because uh, you know people have uh, while uh, information mapping incorporated while I the twenty years I was there, had we trained about three hundred thousand people mm -hmm. in writing um, uh, information mapping. And probably, in, you know, who knows how many since then? Maybe another hundred thousand. But um, you know, that's that's a small, a small number yeah. <laughs> actually worldwide. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's there's still a lot of upside for it, and uh, will I will encourage uh, the viewers here to go investigate that further because I think it's very valuable. Uh, I learned it myself. Uh, some uh, derivation, I'm sure, of it um, back in 1979 and in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, some of my uh, reports and documents that I've been using since the early 80s are all formatted in a, I'll call it a quasi-information mapping style because I'm not sure that I, that I would uh, uh, follow all the rules, but uh, I'm going to investigate that. Uh, I have bought all, uh, three of your books here, and I had to buy them used. Um, but I would encourage others to investigate that if they think that that's going to uh, uh, meet their needs. If I can, I'd like to shift the gears here, uh, here towards the end of our interview and, and go again way back into your early days of NSPI. And we had talked about this a bit earlier, so this shouldn't be a surprise. But uh, one of the things I like to capture uh, in these interviews are some of the stories of past members of NSPI, ISPI, or others who may not have been a member of the, those organizations, but were, were part of uh, this movement, if you will. And so we talked about uh, Gabe Ofeich and Roger Kaufman and Joe Harless and Gary Rummler. So uh, maybe we should start off with the founder of uh, NSPI, uh, Gabe. So, tell us a story about Gabe. <laughs> the story I like to tell about Gabe was when, uh, when I was at uh, when I taught for him at Columbia University. I mean at uh, Catholic University, and uh, we went out uh, one day. I mean he attended my class, and we went out uh, one day to uh, his car. He was going to drive me somewhere, and he opened the trunk of his car, and put his briefcase in, and I looked in the trunk. And there were about 30 briefcases in there. And I said, Gabe, what? What do you got 30 briefcases in here? He says, each one of them is a different project. <laughs> how about that? That's how he managed his information. <laughs> well, that's uh, not, and nowadays we have it so easy. And uh, But there, there was a man who was overloaded. All right. Well, he, <laughs> Uh, uh, let's see. I want to talk about uh, Bob Mager. Yes, um, because he was a he was just a unique individual. When I visited him out here in California, uh, it went to his house. He had a bunch of monkeys, uh, you know, in a cage there, and he was training them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I guess one of the most important stories about Bob, Bob Mager and why he was such a great psychologist, practical psychologist was that every year he tried to, to, to learn something new that was difficult, differently. And I said, well, what are you learning this year? He says, well, last year I learned to juggle. And this year I'm learning to ride on a unicycle. And next year I'm going to learn to juggle on a unicycle. How about that? <laughs> yes. how, 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 many of, how, how, come, how many of you human performance improvers are learning a really difficult thing new every year, like Bob Mager did. I would <laughs> Not imagine me. Uh, only a few at the most. <laughs> I, I still haven't learned to juggle or to, uh, to, to, to do unicycles. <laughs> he would uh, sometimes at the uh, NSPI, ISPI, I guess NSPI conferences before the name change, um, he would uh, do some of that at, during his presentations, and uh, I have seen him juggle. I've seen a video of him do, juggling, um, and, I've, and also I know that one of the other things he added to that was becoming a ventriloquist. And, oh, right. Uh, I, 
that. Yes. He was, he was pretty good at that as well. Um, oh, I have a story. I have a, a Joe Harless. Uh, Joe and I worked together. Joe had some projects uh, with Gilbert, um, and it was, it, was, it was less than a year. But he had a, a, a consulting company. I forgot its, its name. Um, but uh, one of the really interesting things he did, uh, which has stayed with me the rest of my life, has been that he gave uh, each of us a lapel pin that was representative of the work that the company did. And the lapel pin was a little shovel. Uh huh. And representation of a shovel, and and the idea that it represented was that it's it's you're, it's very easy to get into the high abstraction uh, mode, the BS mode, and 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 what a consultant has to do is keep his hand on the shovel all the time, at least one hand. Mm -hmm. Which I think is a, a just an absolutely wonderful metaphor, which I've used the rest of my life, basically. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Any anyone else that uh, comes to mind that uh, you could tell us any any kind of a story on? Uh, haven't got any others, you know, as as kind of uh, fun and 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 different as those. I, I kind of was looking for the idiosyncrasies uh, uh, I don't remember uh, uh, Gary Rummler having a particular idi idiosyncrasy, I'm sure he did like all of us do, but uh, I, I, I don't have a, a, a distinct memory of that Very well uh, uh, Bob, this, I guess we're kind of drawing to a close here and I want to thank you so very much for participating uh, with me in this Skype video interview um, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience related to their efforts in performance improvement? Well, I don't. I haven't really uh, I do that kind of thing, but uh, you know, keep working at it. Uh, there's always chance for uh, uh, self-improvement as well, and lots of new new things in that area. I'm sure. Well, thank you so much again. Here, I'll I'll, I'll say goodbye. Cheers. Bye for now. Thank you.